So good morning again, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for this Ground Source Heat Pump Masterclass. For those of us who are watching this in delay, um, you, if you want to sign up to watch these webinars live, then you can do um, through our uh, online service called Meshwork. Uh, Meshwork is entirely free um, and it's designed um, as a, a safe place to ask questions um, and to collaborate with others um, on anything to do with the sort of renewable um, energy and building services kind of industry, as well as um, more general architectural and um, green building um, industries. Uh, so sign up at, uh, at uh, for Meshwork. Um, as I say, it's entirely free and it's a great little community. And this is where these webinars are shown live. So what we're going to cover today um, is a little bit of an introduction into Mesh Energy. Um, as most of you will have, uh, have be familiar with what we do already, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this. Then we'll look a little bit about what a ground source heat pump actually is, what it does um, and how it works. And then we'll do a little bit of myth busting um, because there are some myths out, out there about ground source heat pumps and what they can and can't do. So we'll just do a little bit of myth busting before we get into, um, into some more of the in-depth stuff about the technology. Then we'll move into the more uh, detailed part um, in the spec and design, um, a little bit about planning permission, uh, sizing and heat demands, space considerations. So that's particularly important for architects. Um, obviously, it's, it's all very well having these systems, but they do take up a little bit of space. So we just need to make sure that the building's design allows um, space for um, all the components. A little bit about collectors, um, about how you actually pull that heat out of the ground um, so that you can use it uh, around the house. Um, and then the other side, obviously we taking the heat from some from the ground we now also need to get it into the building in some way so we'll look a little bit about uh, about heat emitters as well um we'll talk a little bit about noise because um because heat pumps and noise is is always something that people get concerned about and you just want to dispel a few myths around that uh, a little bit about electrical supply as well um electrical supply um because heat pumps are obviously electrically powered um, we need to think about uh, about that and then finally, we'll talk a little bit about uh, subsidies. Um, so that at the moment is really just the domestic uh, renewable heat incentive. That's the, the main subsidy. Um, it looks like there might be some, some future um, subsidies as well, maybe some sort of grant system, um, but that's uh, to be confirmed. So we're not gonna talk about, uh, talk about conjecture about what might happen in the future. What we do know is the renewable heat incentive is open at the moment and it is due to close at the end of March in 2022. Um, so uh, that's, that requires um, the heat pump to be installed and commissioned um, prior to the closing date. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about um, some of the next steps. So there'll be some key takeaway points from this presentation. A little bit about um, how Mesh uh, as a, operates as a company, about how we work and about how you can work with Mesh um, to develop um, schemes. And then finally, a little bit of a space for questions. Um, we'll also touch on some of the future events that are coming up. So let's talk a little bit about Mesh Energy and who we are and what we do. Um, so we're a small building services and um, energy uh, consultancy based in Farnham in Surrey in the UK. Um, and we have um, a fairly simple sort of ethos, really, which is we're trying to simplify things for people. We, we want to keep things simple, straightforward um, and give honest, holistic and impartial advice to people. Um, we feel that, that we can offer that because we have no particular affiliation to any um, particular technology. We just try and choose the best technology for each individual application. And we have no ties with particular manufacturers or particular products, um, which again, helps us um, to advise on what the best products or the best services for a particular um, project. So let's talk a little bit about a ground source heat pump and what it actually is and what it actually does. So it is um, 
It is simply a machine that takes low grade heat from the ground and turns it into high grade heat through a refrigeration cycle, which you can use for um, space heating, domestic hot water heating, and um, if you wanted to uh, process or swimming pool heating as well. Um, so it's, it's a, a fairly simple machine in many ways. Um, it is simply a refrigeration cycle um, and it, it's the same technology as you have in your fridge in your kitchen. So how does it work? Well, as you know, um, occasionally during the summer, uh, even in the UK, we get some sunshine and that has a tendency to warm up the ground. Um, and what you'll find is that once you go about a meter down into the ground, um, the, the, the temperature of the ground will be fairly constant all year round. Um, the heat pump itself, as we've already said, is an electrically powered machine. It uses a refrigeration cycle and it can provide um, heat that then is used for space heating, domestic hot water and um, heating of swimming pools. Um, particularly indoor swimming pools work really well with the ground source heat pumps. Um, for an outdoor pool, um, it may be better to look at an air source heat pump. Um, and that's simply because um, most people don't use outdoor swimming pools in the middle of winter. And during the middle of winter, um, that's when air source heat pumps don't perform quite as well as ground source. Um, during the summer, an air source heat pump will work just as well as a ground source one, but the cheaper installation really helps. Um, what we'll talk about a little bit later in a bit more detail is this thing um, called coefficient of performance or COP. And that is a figure which represents the efficiency um, of the heat pump. And all it is, is um, efficiency is what you want over what you pay for. And if you're looking at a um, gas fired boiler, for example, the efficiency will always be less than one because you'll always put more energy into a gas boiler than useful work you'll get out of it. With a heat pump, because you're harvesting most of the energy um, from outside the building, the useful work you get is greater than the energy you put into the system or the greater the energy you pay for that you put into the system. And that means that you get an effective efficiency of between three and 500%. Um, because it's not actually a true efficiency. Um, we re call it a coefficient of performance. And instead of using a percentage, we just use a, a bare number. And that, that number will vary between three, which is the equivalent of 300% efficient. So you're getting three times as much heat out of the system as your electricity you're putting into it. And five, so in that case, you'd be getting five times as much energy out of the system as electricity you're putting in. And the reason the COP varies is not just from the design of the heat pump, but it's also other design selections that you make throughout the, the uh, process of specification. Where does that energy come from? Well, it comes from these pipes which are buried in the ground um, around the house or the building. And those pipes can come in various forms. And we'll look at that a little bit later on in a bit more detail. So let's talk a little bit, first of all, about a refrigeration cycle and what a refrigeration cycle is and how it works. So what we have here is a very basic refrigeration cycle. And all refrigeration cycles have basically the same components. You have on one side of it a, an evaporator, which is pretty cold. And something that's cold will tend to absorb heat. So you've got heat coming into the system from here. And that is the pipes that are buried in the ground. That heat is enough to boil the refrigerant, which is in the system. Now that refrigerant could be various different things. Um, a lot of the newer heat pumps are starting to use things like propane, um, but there are lots of other refrigerants that, that are around. Um, most of them now tend to be, um, or a lot of them are, are HFCs, so uh, hydrogenated fluorocarbons, something like that. <laughs> I'm not very good at the uh, chemistry. Um, but what you end up with is coming out of your evaporator, you end up with a relatively cool gas that's at low pressure. 
The next component is the compressor. And what the compressor does is it takes this low pressure gas and it turns it into high pressure gas. And this is the point at which you're putting energy into the system. So there's energy coming in here and that's the electricity you're putting into the system. So we've got heat energy coming in at this stage, which is what's coming in from your ground loops. Electrical energy coming in here, which is going into your compressor. And what comes out of the far end of this is a high pressure hot gas. Now, a nice way of demonstrating this is if you take a bicycle pump and you hold your finger over the end and you pump, what you'll find is that the, um, is that the end of the bicycle pump will get quite warm. And that's exactly the same as what your compressor is doing. You're compressing gas and it will go to a higher temperature. That high pressure gas then comes around here. And this is at the condenser. So we've now, what we've done is because we've got this high pressure gas coming into the condenser, um, uh, but because it's under high pressure, it will um, condense more easily. And it will, as it condenses, it will reject heat. And this is the useful heat that you then use to heat your house, heat your hot water or heat your swimming pool. So this is heat coming in and heat going out. So you can see that what we've got is we're putting heat in here. We're putting a little bit of electricity in here. And we're getting lots of heat out of, out of this side. And Effectively, that plus that is equal to what the heat you get out. What you then end up with is at the far end of your um, of your condenser, you're getting actually that says gas, but actually that's a liquid coming out of there. So that's a high pressure liquid coming out of there, which is still relatively warm, but this is a liquid down here. That then goes through an expansion valve, and then that becomes a low pressure, low temperature liquid again, which goes around the cycle, ready to repeat. And the best way of thinking about, about this expansion valve is to think of your can of deodorant. So when you think when you spray a can of deodorant under your arm, it's very cold. And the reason it's very cold is because you've got a liquid in the can, which is under high pressure. When you release that pressure through the expansion valve, the liquid cools down. It's still the same liquid, but it's now at low pressure. And that, that um, is a reduction in energy. And that, that energy is, uh, is um, that's, that's where you get the cold coming from. And, uh, and so that's the way to think of it. So think about this is, this is your can of deodorant down here. This is your bicycle pump up here. And, You've got this special liquid that, uh, that, that changes easily from liquid to gas um, that goes round and it just goes round and round and round. So this is a sealed system. Well, fortunately, that means that we don't actually really need to look at the next couple of slides because this really just goes through um, through what, we, what we've been talking about. But basically, we've got low grade heat on the left hand side of this equation and high grade heat on the right hand side and a little bit of electricity changing from low grade to high grade heat and this is what all these slides explain you'll get the slide pack at the end of this so uh, so don't worry about taking notes about this because uh, it's all explained beautifully um, as we go through it okay so next thing is uh is this uh, this is this little slide just explains it in a little bit more detail and just shows what some of the components are but we've kind of been through that so let's talk about some of the myths now, because these are things that put people off ground source heat pumps, and we really need to, um, to dispel those myths. So, myth one, collector pipes have to be buried deep in the ground. Well, it is true that you don't want the collector pipes to be buried um, at a depth where they're either going to receive mechanical damage or they're going to be affected by frost um, 
or um or you know the changes in ambient temperature so usually between about one and 1.2 meters is sufficient to avoid um being in the frost layer so you can see um the photo on the on the right hand side of the screen here um, that's a fairly typical depth of trench probably between one and 1.2 meters um the reason that 1.2 meters is quite often um used as a sort of as a sort of good depth is that there was an old rule and it doesn't apply anymore um that that's um that said that any um anything that was dug below 1.2 meters had to be supported at the edges um the rule now actually is that, that every um, excavation should be risk assessed um to sit for for the risk of collapse uh, but basically what it is is it's trying to make sure that that if somebody was working in a trench and the trench collapsed that they wouldn't be buried and suffocated um so that was where the 1.2 meter rule came from but 1.2 meters is generally enough that you're not going to get too much danger of collapse burying somebody but equally it's deep enough that you're not going to get any significant variation in temperature um throughout the season from from effects from above myth number two collector pipes freeze the ground so it is true that you are taking heat from the ground and it's true that if you take too much heat from the ground you will freeze it however um, a well-designed system will not freeze the ground. Um, you will not get ground, ground heave from uh, sort of freeze-thaw um, type effects. Uh, what you'll see is you'll see um, the ground getting down to two or three degrees in the middle of uh, the winter at the, at the lowest point and then recharging over the summer um, so it gets back to six or seven degrees. If the ground is freezing, that is generally a very good sign that the collector array has been undersized. Um, and somebody's made a mistake in the design. Um, so it is possible to freeze the ground, but a well-designed system should not freeze the ground. Myth number three, you need lots of ground available. Well, we'll touch on this a little bit further on, um, but actually you don't need a huge amount of ground area um, to install a ground source heat pump, because whilst this diagram shows a, uh, a collector array which is installed horizontally, and that does require quite a lot of ground area. Um, you can also install boreholes, and boreholes go straight down, typically to a depth of between 150 and 200 meters. And those boreholes um, can be used to, to provide a huge amount of heat uh, from a relatively small area. Myth four, they create very high electricity bills. Well, if you have a, a centrally heated house, which is um, heated by gas, and you take the gas boiler out and you put a heat pump in, then it is true your electricity bill will go up um, because you are effectively not paying your, as much for gas anymore because you may still be using it for cooking, but you're not using it for um, space heating anymore. And you are um, going to be putting some extra money onto your electricity bill. However, again, a well-designed ground source heat pump system will be cheaper to run than a gas boiler. And this is where we'll need to start thinking quite carefully about design to make sure that we get the high efficiencies that we require. And finally, myth number five, ground source heat pumps are so expensive, you'll never get your money back. Well, Ground source heat pumps are amongst the more expensive, uh, most expensive types of heating system to install. However, they also offer the lowest possible running costs of any heating system. So what we'd say is get the things right first by doing the, the right things in terms of um, insulating the building properly, reducing consumption, and also reducing, by doing that, you reduce the peak demand on the heat pump. You can then put a smaller heat pump in that reduces your capital cost. You'll also have very low running costs from a from a well installed heat pump. And so you will get your money back. And of course, you've also got things like the domestic RHI, which can help offset some of that additional capital cost. So you will get your money back. OK, so that covers the, the sort of basics and some of the myths. So we're now going to move on to a little bit more of the detail and some of the considerations um, that you need to think about when you're specifying or designing a heat pump system. So the first thing to think about is the sizing of the system. And for this, we would always go back 
um, to this energy hierarchy, um, where you'll see that um, our heat pump is sitting all the way down here, uh, fourth layer down in our energy hierarchy. So what we're saying is, these, this is the order that we should be doing priorities. So we should be prioritizing all these three things above putting a ground source heat pump in. So let's start talking about from the top. Well, building location orientation form. Well, it's unlikely we can change the physical location of the building by much, but we might be able to use topology on a new build um, to help reduce heat demands and reduce cooling demands. So that's something that we could be thinking about how we site the building on a particular site. But it's, you know, if we've got a house that's in London, we can't move it to, uh, to the south of France. Or um, if we've got a building um, that's in Scotland, we're unlikely to be able to move it down to the Midlands um, to improve its location. Um, orientation, clearly we could look at how the building is orientated. Um, that's probably more of a thing to do with overheating rather than rather than um, for so so reducing um, cooling demands uh, rather than um, uh, rather than reducing the heating demands. But again, because we can do heating and cooling from a ground source heat pump, um, that's something to bear in mind. And finally, the form of the building. So this this is probably the the biggest single thing that as architects we have control over. And this is about things like um, how big the windows are, what, uh, you know, how, what's the ratio of the internal volume to the wall area um, and using form to reduce um, the potential effects of over or under heating. So that is probably the first and most important thing to think about. Once we've settled on those things and, you know, bearing in mind that in a retrofit situation, you're unlikely to have any control of any of those things. The next thing to look at is the fabric element design. So that is how physically are my walls, windows, doors and other thermal elements made up um, in order to reduce the heating and cooling demands. And that is things like how much insulation you use, what types of insulation you use. Um, the um the standards you require for the windows um things like uh like uh heat and light transmittance through windows as well can play a big have a big effect on on the overall um efficiency of a building um if we get that right then we need to move down and look at air tightness and ventilation so in most buildings um, and most new builds the ventilation heat losses um, especially without in, without having some sort of mechanical heat uh, mechanical ventilation heat recovery system could be as much as 50 percent of the building's heat load so we need to think very carefully about about ventilation now the sort of 70s solution to this was well let's just make buildings more airtight um, the issue with that is if you make a building more airtight then you also decrease the indoor air quality um, once you hit a certain point so you've got to get this balance between air tightness and ventilation right and you can use uh, certain pieces of technology like mechanical ventilation and heat recovery um, to to help improve that balance and then we get down to actually getting the heating system right so this is where our our ground source heat pump sits is in this block here and so we've so what we're saying is let's get the building um correct before we start looking at uh, uh all these other things because a ground source heat pump is quite an expensive thing to do and actually a lot of these things could be done with good design relatively cheaply before we start looking at anything too weird and wacky and wonderful so as we always say follow the energy hierarchy make all the economically um, viable and visually acceptable fabric improvements before specifying renewable technologies. So we've done that um, and we've ended up with the design. Um, this is a, a project we worked on a little while ago. Um, and the first thing we're doing is we're going to then work out what the external design temperature is 
And that's simply a function of the elevation of the building. So the height above sea level and its location in the country. We're then going to specify um, the hot water flow temperature, and that will depend upon the sizing of the heat emitters that we're going to install. So we need to know what the um, what what the heat, how the heat pump is going to perform. The higher we make that hot water flow temperature, the lower the coefficient of performance of the heat pump is going to be. Then we need to think about this peak heat uh, space heating demands um, based on the um, standard room temperatures. And that those, those are set out by uh, SIBSI and others. Um, but typically you'd be looking at 21 degrees in living spaces, 22 degrees in bathrooms, and then 18 degrees in circulation areas and places like kitchens, utility rooms, um, and bedrooms. We then need to add on a little bit more for domestic hot water, because obviously the heat pump is going to be doing your hot water as well. And when it's preparing hot water, it can't be doing space heating at the same time. So we need to add a little bit of um, extra power to the heat pump to allow it to get make domestic hot water in a reasonable time. And then what we do is we add up those peak space heating demands. We add up the uh, to the domestic hot water and that um, it gives us a good sizing for the heat pump. Um, it's worth noting you shouldn't oversize heat pumps um, by more than absolutely necessary. So if you came up with a um, peak heat demand of, uh, for the space heating and domestic hot water of say 20 kilowatts, um, you should be looking at a heat pump of around 20 kilowatts. So for example, if we looked at the Eco Forest range, they do a heat pump that does up to 22 kilowatts. So that would be the one to select. You wouldn't select a 30 kilowatt or a 40 kilowatt heat pump in the same way as you might do with a, with a gas boiler where you'd oversize them quite significantly. Next thing to talk about is planning permission. Um, so we're quite lucky with ground source heat pumps is that they don't really need to be, um, they, they're usually just done under permitted development. There's no uh, requirements for planning permission. But obviously if you're starting to um, do major alterations, um, alterations to uh, listed buildings, et cetera, then it's worth um, getting some more specialist advice. Um, so just talk to your council, uh, talk to a, to, to a uh, planning consultant and just make sure that you're getting everything right um, because you don't want to be starting to rip things out again. Let's, let's talk about a little bit about this internal space requirements. Um, so this, is a, this, this photo shows a fairly typical um, small installation of a heat pump. Um, so this white box here, that's the actual heat pump itself. Um, Next to that, uh, we have a buffer tank. So this serves the uh, heating system. Um, and these are, these are quite typical, it's quite typically used um, with ground source heat pump installations. Um, this one looks like it's probably a 200 litre buffer tank. And then finally on the right hand side here, we have our domestic hot water cylinder. So those of you who are, um, who are familiar with, um, uh, with with boilers, we'll know that there are combi boilers which do away with the need for a domestic hot water cylinder. Unfortunately, there is no equivalent in heat pumps. Um, they see, you simply don't have the electrical power available um, in most cases to to do that kind of um, to to have that sort of high peak output um, that you'd have um, with a combi boiler. So you got to think of it much more as like a sort of system boiler type installation. Um, the reason for the buffer tank is that it, it just allows the minimum runtime of the compressor, um, but it also gives you hydraulic separation um, between um, the flow rates that are required for the heat pump and the flow rates required by the heating systems. Um, and from a contractual point of view, it's also quite a neat point to separate the system um, because usually um, a specialist contractor will install the heat pump um, the buffer tank and the cylinder, and then a more general plumber would probably do the, um, the main heating system. And what you can do is the heat pump installer installs everything up to up to this point, And then everything that side of it is um, 
or sorry, on the heating side, everything that side of it is is down to the plumber. And equally, um, everything, uh, the heat pump installer would also install the hot water cylinder, but everything to, to do with the actual hot water distribution would then be down to the general plumber. So ground source heat pumps usually installed in a plant room or sometimes in a utility room. Um, you can see that this this sort of um, this would be a fairly typical installation for a medium to large sized house. Um, I have seen these installed also um, out externally um, where we've put some sort of um, external enclosure to effectively make a little mini plant room outside. Um, you can't expose these. Um, these aren't. Um, IP65 rated products. So, so you can't put this completely outside, but you can put it in some sort of um, external enclosure. As a rough rule of thumb, about four square meters is a good, good amount to allow for the footprint of the heat pump and the hot water cylinder and the buffer tank. Um, we'll talk about solid bore noise tra transmission a little bit later on, but just bear that, that in mind and we'll come back to it. And then think about also the pipe routes, um, especially for the collector pipes. So we're going to be bringing some some pipes in from outside. Obviously, we've got uh, we've got the collectors outside. We're going to need to bring those into the uh, into the building. So just need to think about the routes um, through the building to get to to the uh, the plant room. So that brings us quite neatly onto um, these three diagrams, which show the three main collector types. So let's start with horizontal ground loops. So these are probably the most common types of collector for domestic installations. And a horizontal ground loop um, is literally uh, some pipes that are buried about 1.2 meters below the ground. And they're typically the cheapest system to install. Um, they can, there's two major methods, um, either bulk excavation, where you dig the, the ground away completely down to 1.2 metres, or you install in trenches. They work really well um, in systems where you've got heating only and no cooling. Um, they're not quite so good for rejecting heat to during the summer. Uh, the collector design is relatively simple. You can normally just dig a small trial pit so you know what the ground conditions are like and then work out what the uh, the likely um, extraction rate you're going to have available for that ground type is. Um, so it's quite easy. And you can do the installation just with simple ground uh, earth moving equipment, which you may well already have on site anyway. Um, so literally just um, a digger with a, with a, um, with a reasonable sized bucket on it um, will we'll do the installation in most instances. As a rule of thumb, um, the amount of land area available is the highest for this. Um, so you want to have between three and five times the gross internal floor area of the building. And that area must be free from impermeable surfaces and from heavy plants. Um, and from uh, and it's probably best not to put it in land that's going to be used for agricultural use either. Um, so you put it under paddocks or um, under lawns, um, under light planting, you know, so sort of flower beds, small shrubs, that kind of thing. Um, but you can't put heavy trees on it. You can't put it under, um, you couldn't put it under a tarmac uh, drive um, because the rate, because rainwater is actually one of the principal things that brings heat back into the ground and allows it to recharge. Um, seasonal coefficient of performance. So the, so the, so the um, efficiency you get may be slightly lower um, than with boreholes, um, but it's pretty marginal. Um, so the the lower capital cost um, probably outweighs any marginal change in running cost. So the second most uh, common system is vertical boreholes. And um, these are very widely used on commercial installations and on larger installations. Um, but they are a little bit more expensive to install than the horizontal loops that we just talked about. So these are big, deep U-tubes um, that go down to between one and 200 meters. Um, and um, they're really good for more compact sites or um, sites where there maybe isn't um, enough um, available land for horizontal collectors, or perhaps where you've got particularly mature um, planting in a, in a retrofit situation and people don't want to start cutting down trees or moving 
large shrubs or those kind of things. Um, so they, they can be quite useful in those types of situations or perhaps in a situation where um, you've got a, a very heavily sloped site or something like that and, it, and a horizontal um, uh, system would be, would be quite awkward to install. They may give slightly better COPs than a horizontal system and hence slightly lower running costs, but it's pretty marginal, as I said before. Um, and they are better for rejecting heat to um, during the summer. So if you're using cooling and you're operating the, the heat pump in a reverse cycle mode, so you're getting chilled water out of the heat pump and you're putting heat back into the ground, um, then boreholes can work better. They are more expensive to install than a horizontal collect system. And that's because you do need specialist borehole drilling contractors um, and special borehole drilling rigs um, need to be brought onto site. And, and it's usually the cost of um, the cost of getting those those things to site and those um, those specialist installation teams um, can make it not particularly attractive for smaller installations. If you're doing multiple boreholes, then obviously you get this uh, economy of scale um, with boreholes. And because you're drilling so deep, the design of boreholes is really quite a specialist thing. Um, so that's where talking to somebody like Mesh can really help um, because we will be able to really nail down exactly how much um, heat is going into and out of the building and therefore exactly what the cost of the borehole um, is going to be. Um, getting that design right um, will save you a lot of um either additional cost if you oversize the boreholes or a lot of heartache if you undersize them and end up having to um, having to drill further boreholes and allow the system to recover if you undersize them. And finally, we're going to look at the, the last type, which is an open loop um, ground, ground source. Um, and this is where you use a, um, a source of groundwater. So typically a, a sort of twin well arrangement and what you do is you pull groundwater out of the ground, um, you cool that groundwater, you use the heat from that groundwater to, um, to provide your heating, and then you put the, the chilled water back into the ground again through a, a separate absorption well. Um, so this, is, this isn't taking water out of a lake or a river, um, this is groundwater, um, and the quality of that groundwater is quite important as well. Um, it tends to work best in areas where you've got large chalk aquifers. So quite a lot of the south of England, um, this can work quite well. Uh, if you've got um, chalk aquifers at a reasonable depth, um, then this can, can be a very, very good way of, um, of getting a highly efficient system. This will offer potentially the highest efficiencies out of any ground source system. So groundwater is pumped from a source well through the heat pump and then absorbed back into the ground um, through the absorption well. And it gives a, a good um, source temperature and can give exceptional coefficients of performance. Um, the last part to bear in mind is that um, although these are relatively straightforward to get, uh, you will require a permit from the Environment Agency if you're starting to abstract more than 20,000 litres of water a day. That sounds like a huge amount, but actually it's not um, because the, the amount of water you'll put through the heat pump, bear in mind you're only you know, sucking out the ground and putting it back into the ground, is actually quite a lot, um, especially during the just sort of peak season. Um, but the EA are getting more and more used to this type of system, so it's, it's becoming more and more straightforward to get those permits. So let's now talk about the other side of the system. So we've talked about the source side. We now have to think about that heat has to be in balance with what's coming out. Um, so we're, we're taking water into one side of the heat pump. Um, we're taking heat into one side of the heat pump and we've got to reject it at the other side of the heat pump. And what we're rejecting it through is some sort of heat emitter system, uh, which is going to be where you're going to heat your, heat your house up from. So Underfloor heating is probably the best system if it's feasible to do. So because it offers the lowest flow temperatures, it gives you the best coefficient of performance from the, from the heat pump. Remember I've mentioned before, the higher you make that flow temperature in the heat pump, the lower the coefficient of performance. Um, because you're effectively create, making your whole floor one big giant radiator, um, it means you can 
get that floor to be relatively cool because you don't need that that floor to be very hot it means you can use like lower flow temperatures and that then has a knock-on benefit for the heat pump um underfloor also has other benefits such as a greater level of comfort and well-being um it doesn't create uh, drafts it's very flexible with the way you place furniture you don't have to think about you know not blocking radiators those kind of things um so it's it's um it's fantastic a uh, little side point also for asthma sufferers um is um because it doesn't tend to set up convection currents in the same way as a radiator would uh, you get less dust movement dust, um, and therefore less dust in the air, which can help if you've got any kind of respiratory issue um, such as asthma. So it's really good from that point of view. And you can use underfloor heating with most floor finishes, um, even wooden floors. Um, the, the, for the best performance with underfloor heating, uh, a tiled or ceramic floor is, is the absolute best, um, but wooden floors work quite well. And even carpet can be used with underfloor heating is, is no problem at all. Um, downsides of underfloor. Well, if you've got an existing house, it could be pretty expensive to retrofit. And it can be a little bit slower to respond to changes in, um, uh, changes in demand. Um, but that's, again, less of an issue with a heat pump where you tend to keep the building uh, warm all the time. So... The next one to look at is our old friend, the radiator. Um, so radiators are generally easier for retrofit situations. There may well already be a radiator system installed in, in a lot of houses um, that you might be able to repurpose. Uh, it's generally a cheaper system to install than underfloor, um, even on new build. Um, and you do obviously get the full choice of floor coverings and floor finishes. So if you want a particularly unusual floor finish, um, then it might be that you can't use underfloor with that with that particular floor finish. Um, but there are downsides to radiators. Uh, the first thing is that you will always, nearly always, have higher flow temperatures with a radiator than you'd have with the um, with an equivalent underfloor system. And that means you'll get a lower coefficient of performance. And you've obviously got to think about where those radiators are going to go. And that might reduce the design flexibility of where you put furnishings um, in the room. So just another thing to bear in mind. And the other thing is, is as in an effort to bring down those flow temperatures, um, you might go for either specialist low flow temperature radiators, or you might just oversize standard radiators. Um, to give the to give the same output, that makes either the radiators a bit more expensive, or um, will tend to make the radiators physically larger um, than you'd have in an equivalent um, house that had a gas boiler and, and higher flow temperatures. Let's talk a little bit about noise. Uh, we mentioned noise a little bit earlier, particularly solid borne noise, um, but generally speaking, noise isn't too much of an issue with a ground source heat pump which is a good, good piece of news. Um, usually, as I say, utility rooms or plant rooms are used. Um, and if you do a little bit of thinking, then you can avoid any kinds of noise issues uh, for the building occupiers. Um, they're certainly going to be quieter um, than, um, than dishwashers, washing machines, those kind of things. Um, yeah, they sort of sit in the 40 to 50 decibel range um, probably even quieter than that for, for most modern heat pumps. And they really are very, very quiet. So where do we, uh, where do we see um, risks from noise with, with ground source? Well, actually, the most common one is solid bore noise. So um, the compressor in a, in a heat pump will tend to vibrate a little bit. If those vibrations are transmitted through the pipework and through the, um, through the structure of the building, then that can cause irritating noises in other rooms. Um, so to mitigate that, you just use anti-vibration feet um, or anti-vibration strips below the heat pump. Um, so you're uh, putting effectively an acoustic um, separation between the heat pump and the building. And uh, you also need to just sort of think about what the, um, what the floor is actually made out of and how it's going to stop vibration being transmitted. Um, it's pretty straightforward stuff. Um, and then the final thing is obviously if you have a rigid connection from the heat pump to the heating system, then potentially you could transmit noise through the pipework. 
um, and that's um, simply mitigated by using flexible couplings um, between the, the heat pump and the uh, and the fixed pipe work. And that just allows that tiny bit of movement to be absorbed by those flexible connections. So now the last one, this is the last sort of big consideration I'd say, which is the electrical supply. So electrical supplies come in two main types. Um, so most homes in the UK are equipped with a single phase electricity supply standard and a single phase electricity supply will give you around about 23 kilowatts of electrical power. So that 23 kilowatts has to do everything um, so in a typical home, that will be doing um, your space heating if you're doing um, using a, a heat pump, um, plus maybe cooking, plus your lighting, your socket outlets, um, uh, and potentially something like an electric vehicle charger. Um, so those might be the big, the big uh, things. So in terms of what you can get away with, um, from a heat pump's point of view, um, you'd be looking at uh, installations of probably around 20 kilowatts thermal. So bearing in mind the COP, that's going to be around about five to seven kilowatts of, um, of electrical input. So that adds for your 23 kilowatts. So that's giving you plenty of headroom for all the other things that you're gonna be using electricity for around the house. Um, as a rough rule of thumb, that's going to equate to about a 500 square meter um, new build house or around 300 square meters if you're looking at a sort of fairly typical retrofit situation. Um, in most cases, that won't require any kind of power upgrade. Um, there are some older properties that still have 60 amp um, fuses. Um, the DNO will come out and upgrade that to 100 amp for free in most cases. But if you're in any doubt, carry out a diversity analysis um, so that you determine what the, the uh, maximum demand on your electricity supply is. And that's basically just write down everything that could be using electricity simultaneously in the house and work out how much electricity that adds up to. And finally, make sure that your ground source heat pump is um, fed from a dedicated radial circuit. Um, so that's a circuit that comes straight out of the consumer unit off to the heat pump um, so that you um of practicing safe isolation three phase supplies are generally used for commercial installations and domestic installations that are larger than 20 kilowatts so those are pretty big houses you know 300 square meters plus on retrofit 500 square meters plus um for new build that will require a power upgrade in most domestic properties um, because most, most homes, as I say, only have a single phase supply as standard. Um, if you're lucky enough to live in Germany, then almost all houses have three phase supplies anyway, so it's not too much of an issue. And um, it may be that, um, that, that you need to consider a three phase supply if you've got other high users of electricity on site. Um, Common ones are things like um, cookers, electric showers, which can can take a huge amount of power, um, and electric vehicle charging points. Although a lot of electric vehicle charging points will have automatic load curtailments available if required. So onto the uh, onto the financial side. Um, this used to be a lot longer. Uh, this section. Um, but uh, we've seen a little bit of a trimming of the of the grants and incentives that are available now. Um, so the other one that's really left is now the renewable heat incentive. And and there's only one of the two flavours of that left, which is the domestic RHI. Um, so the commercial RHI was phased out in March 2021. The domestic RHI is due to be phased out in March 2022. Um, it looks likely there will be some sort of replacement for it. Um, but the details of that have yet to be published. Uh, the Green Home Grant is now gone, um, so um, so that really should have come off the uh, off the list there. So the domestic renewable heat incentive is paid over seven years, um, and basically you stump up the cash to buy your installation, and then you get paid back in uh, you get drip fed back some of the money. Um, that you paid out 
um, over the first seven years after installation. And the idea is that the amount of money you get back should offset the additional um, cost of installation that you, you stumped up at the first, at the first point. Um, so the payments are meant to reflect that cost of installation. It's tax-free money, uh, which is quite nice. And there's um, some maximum payments and um, some payments uh, per pence uh, in pence per kilowatt hour of renewable energy that you've used. So for a ground source heat pump, that is the most generous maximum payment of £32,000 split over seven years. And you can get up to 20.89 pence per kilowatt hour um, that you actually that you actually produce. Um, that may be metered or it may be deemed uh so if you 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 can get a deemed payment based on your energy performance certificate for your home um if you go down the heat metering route then you have to submit um a claim on a quarterly basis um for the amount of energy that you've used in that quarter um and it was able to be used in conjunction with the green homes grant but now the green homes grant is no longer around um that is no longer relevant Okay, so that reaches the end of the um, of the sort of main bits about the ground source heat pump. I've taken slightly longer to go through this than I thought I would, um, but we will have a little bit of time for questions. Um, so let's uh, let's first of all look at the top considerations. So number one consideration is always improve the fabric of the building first before designing a heating system to fit into it. Um, you'd be amazed how many people. Um, come to us and they say oh, I want a heat pump but I don't really want to think about insulating my building any better um, it's it's not the way to do it you know get the building right first and then put the then update the heating system to um, reflect the the improvements in the building um, if you're building designing from new then design services in early because um, it really helps with integration um, especially allowing space for the heat pumps um, match the heat pump size to the peak demand and don't oversize or undersize the heat pump um, because you'll end up with issues um, or additional costs. Consider the ground conditions, land use and space when choosing collector systems. Um, so, you know, think about, you know, if you're thinking about that paddock that you were going to put the horizontal ground loops underneath, if you're likely to build, you know, an extension or another house or something like that, um, on that in the future then maybe think about a borehole system where you could avoid that that area because you don't want to be starting to rip um, collectors out um, in you know a few years time uh, use underfloor heating where possible to maximize the seasonal coefficient of performance of the heat pump you know lower flow temperatures better performance if you can't use um, underfloor heating then use low flow temperature radiators or fan coil units um, to give the best possible system efficiency. Avoid noise issues um, by uh, insulating the system from solid borne noise. And then check the electrical supply and allow for any upgrades in your costs. And remember finally that, um, that there are subsidy systems around. Um, so remember the domestic RHI um, to help with financing um, the installation. Okay. So this little slide just talks a little bit about where mesh gets involved, um, but really we can get involved everywhere from concept design, at feasibility stages, you know, doing initial SAP calculations, initially energy calculations, um, you know, sketching where, you know, the sort of spaces that might be required for, for plants, all those kind of things at sort of REBA stage one, two and three. Then getting a bit more into detailed design, um, full m and packages and install recommendations at the detailed design and specification stage, stage four, and then doing um, a tender review and installation oversight at stages five and six during the build. And finally, um, increasingly we are being asked, and I think it's really important uh, to, to look at energy monitoring and um, air quality um, in post-occupancy evaluation because that's how we learn and we get better as an industry um, by learning from what we've done in the past and how we can improve on that. Um, and I think too often people cut off at stage six and it's like, well, okay, we've built that now, let's move on to the next thing. And we don't actually learn the lessons um, from what we've done in the past.
So that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, uh, please, um, if anybody's got any uh, any questions, um, please tap them into the uh, into the chat window, and I'll do my best to answer them. The the next round of um, of events um, is we've we've we're now walking sort of going into a little bit about. Um, about sort of more environmental design um, starting next Wednesday on the 1st of September, um, which is around uh, biophilic design um, in green infrastructure. So that's, um, so that's all about how you can use plants to enhance your indoor environment. Um, a little bit of a, an introduction to um, lighting design with, uh, with Luke, who's a really good guy. And then, uh, and then finally the importance of green infrastructure um in a couple of in three weeks time okay uh just one question from brian here um if you have a tight site um that mainly needs hard landscaping does permeable paving work okay for water filtration um so the answer to that brian is if you've got a tight site you're probably going to be looking at boreholes and boreholes can go under impermeable paving well thank you very much everybody um i will sign off there um, enjoy the rest of your days and I hope to see you again at another um, another Mesh Energy webinar very soon.